Well, welcome everybody to our talk, Giotto and his legacy. We're joined by Dimitri Gladkov and Andy Pankow. Sorry, I'm trying really careful to pronounce everyone's names properly. Um, we're a small non-profit charity and we promote the education about pre-modern art through social media and our website. We also have our YouTube, which is what this is recording for. The aim is, is the talk will be about 35 minutes long and afterwards we're going to open up to a Q&A session, which will not be recorded and it won't go onto the YouTube. So you don't have to worry about that. And now I'm going to pass on to Dimitri, who's going to introduce himself and Andy um, in more detail. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. We are talking today about uh, Giotto di Bandone and his art and influence uh, on, on, on Renaissance and, and modern art. And we are relating this uh, talk partly to a very recent uh, St. Francis of Assisi uh, uh, exhibition at the National Gallery, which, uh, which obviously could not, for obvious reasons, uh, have actual work by Giotto, but it did have um, some photographs in the in one of the final sections of the show. And we thought it would be a great idea to pick up some of the themes uh, of the exhibition, but also talk about the um, enduring legacy of Giotto um, on, um, on on art over the over the centuries. We have Andy Pankhurst uh, joining us today, an artist exhibiting with Browns and Derby, and for many years. Uh, teaching at Slade School of Art, Royal Academy, and Royal Drawing School. Um, as for an artist uh, perspective, I think that would be uh, really interesting to hear Andy's thoughts. But also, I think, Andy, there is a personal element um, to uh, to study of Jota's work as well in, in your over, over your life. Uh, and that is um, Andy spending a year on a scholarship following as a Slade student um, studying the works in Scaveni ch Chapel in Padua, and obviously um, dealing and 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 thinking of Giotto's art on a daily basis in situ of his great work. Um, I think with that, I'll pass over to Andy um, for for the talk, and the, we will we have plenty of illustrations to go through. Um, Andy, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Dimitri. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, yeah, okay, that's all worked all right. Um, so yes, Giotto and his legacy. We're gonna we're gonna see this image again, a very famous image of uh, St. Francis. And again, as Dimitri mentioned about being inspired by the exhibition earlier this year at the, the National Gallery. Um just let's get that so I can see. Um so this is from Giorgio Fasai. I'm just gonna a bit of reading. Um so Giotto not only captured his master's Chimabui own style, but also began to draw so ably from life that he made a decisive break with a crude traditional Byzantine style and brought to life the great art of painting as we know it today, introducing the technique of drawing accurately from life, which had been neglected for more than 200 years. I think it's a bit more than that, possibly. He then goes on to say, this is Giorgio Fasari. He was, let's say, very famous if you want to know about the lives of the artist. He was a contemporary and a brilliant pupil of Michelangelo. Uh, so he goes on to say in this famous Lives of the Artist, in my opinion, painters owe to Giotto, the Florentine painter, exactly the same debt they owe to nature, which constantly serves them as a model and whose finest and most beautiful aspects they are always striving to imitate and reproduce. For after the many years during which the methods and outlines of good painting had been buried under the ruins caused by war, it was Giotto alone who, by God's favour, rescued and restored the art, even though he was born among incompetent artists. Getting quite um, tough here, isn't he? It was, indeed, a great miracle that in so gross and incompetent an age, Giotto could be inspired to such good purpose that by his work he completely restored the art of design of which his contemporaries knew little or nothing. Um, it's quite interesting that in terms of maybe one good thing about contemporary art, things never change. Uh, here, this is uh, it's not incompetent at all. This is an in the National Gallery. This is the earliest work um, by uh, of the Virgin and Child. Um, again, it's got a narrative storytelling. Um, it's not quite Byzantine. Uh, again, this idea of iconography. 
Um, but you've got to remember, if you think back, say, to uh, Roman paintings, so you can think of pre uh, Vesuvius erupting in sort of AD 79, got the Villa of Mystery is a good thing to, to think about in terms of figuration, this idea of lifelike. And so from that period right up to this, the Renaissance is a rebirth, of course. And the idea of iconography was to do with this idea of heavenly, um, wasn't sort of earthly, put it kind of in simple terms. Um, you get, this is from Chimabui from the National Gallery, actually only photographed yesterday, um, where the new, uh, they've got all the early Renaissance in the lower galleries, or the ground floor galleries now. Um, and it says here, this revolutionary interpretation of a traditional image Chimibui maintains the majesty, of, the majesty of the divine infant seen in earlier representations, but it introduces a new naturalism and tenderness by showing the child touching his mother's hand. Um, and it also says, in placing the throne at an angle, the artist also creates a sense of space. Yes, the there is perspective, but it's, again, it's not quite right. Again, there's no linear perspective going on at th th this point. Um, so, yes, Chimabu was revolutionary, but we can see here in Dante, um, Dante and his famous quote in the um, Purgatory, the Divine Comedy, in painting, Chimabu thought he held the field, and now it's Giotto they acclaim. The former only keeps a shadowed fame. And then again, this is, um, you see, this is by Giotto, uh, quite a late Giotto, again, in Florence, the Bargello, again, of the, here's Dante there. Um, in the National Gallery, again, in terms of about the perspective, again, a reasonably late work. Uh, well, no, well, 13, 10, 18, the Pentecost uh, and workshop. Uh, you've got perspective going on through here. Uh, it's almost as pretty close to kind of a linear perspective you see uh, within this interior. Um, they're all speaking in the, the idea that they've um, been touched by, kind of got the Holy Spirit, and they're talking uh, in, in all these different languages, hence these people listening in. Uh, this is actually a much weaker work. This is not by Giotto. It's a kind of a Neapolitan follower of Giotto, it says, but I mean pretty weak, actually. The head and the form of the torso coming forward, it's not very good. Um, but let's so let's actually go and see go similar to as um Dimitri mentioned the idea of visiting in our virtual world seeing the photographs that we can we're going to Assisi um and we got the basilica and there is and we're actually going to show you just the here's the interior of the upper church there are there is the lower chambers the amazing paintings Simon Martini that there's more Giottos down there that um, are done slightly after the Paduan pictures, which we're going to mostly focus on towards, well, the main focus, actually, after looking at visiting Florence. Um, and you've got the Lorenzetti brothers. Uh, and, of course, that's where actually where St. Francis is, um, in turn, is, is, is buried. But this is the famous upper chapel uh, where you have um, the life of St. Francis. Uh, we have up here the Old Testament, which again is really attributed to Roman art, well, Cimabue and Roman artists. There's Petro Calvino, and there's Jacobo Toretti. Uh, this is again the Cimabue, famous one of the negative, which is actually round the back. There's also, of course, there's the painting by Cimabue uh, of actually with a portrait of St. Francis as well. Um, I've got here, so the, here we are in this, this upper church. This is some, uh, some notes way back actually 30 years ago as Dimitri said um when I was I lived in Italy particularly Padua um but here I was visiting Assisi and this idea I'm making um I said the changeover um pointing particularly to this image here um where you've got Isaac blessing Jacob uh with this concept of um and this is actually Chimabui here uh, I think the um expulsion of Adam um where I think because the whole no one knows. I mean, these are the famous things, say the St. Francis, which again is always attributed to, to Giotto, but there's a really a big question mark. No one really knows who's there. There's probably various hands going at play. Um, but that idea of the changeover from the idea of the Byzantine iconography, um, and this idea of realism. So even though, yes, there's a sense, sense of realism within Chimabui, but I felt here was where it really kind of happened. And I'm focusing, there it is here, this idea of, I think Giotto's hand was certainly in these figures here. Um, and there it is, and there's a difference between these figures in comparison to this figure here. Again, you've got more of a sort of sense of 
iconography. So, in my, well, in my opinion, um, this is where I think this is suddenly the say the changeover from this real realism starts to take 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 place. And there's again another kind of a close up. Um, there, I've got the big question mark here, Jota. So again, the image we just seen a moment ago. Uh, so yes, this whole cycle of from the Old Testament to Saint Francis, um, and I think uh, well, let's have a look here again. There's some of the Old Testament ones. Uh, then we've got here the Saint Francis. There's this theory which I tend to go along with that, and we'll look at this in relationship to the Padrian pictures, that the, of the the mind of this artist. I mean, think of how these these individual panels the Let's think of this, these each scene. So you've got compositions, you've got these different compositions. You've got three scenes here. You've got again, in terms of the architecture, there's all actually quite a, a regular. And they think mathematically is probably Giotto. I mean, there's one theory that he might have worked out the actual individual proportions. So the, the geometry, not necessarily the actual the, the pictures themselves. Um, I go along with along with that somewhat uh and again i'm going to pick up on that when we look at the works in uh, uh padua and of course this is one of the most famous um images from the legend of saint francis of course um where saint francis so i prefer saying the preaching to, to the birds but we are going to revisit this looking to more of a relating to a 20th century artist and the idea of that legacy of giotto so we're going to move swiftly. Uh, as I say, there's so much to see in the CC. Of course, as I said, I've completely missed out the lower chapels, which are incredible. But we're going, we're visiting Florence. Um, basically, this is when you come out of this train station. I will say turn right, come round. Um, look at this. This is this was photograph was taken in 2019. Uh, again, I can remember just walking through these main doors. Now you have to go through the side and pay, etc. Um, so this is the great, say, Santa Maria della Vella. Um, when you imagine walking down as if you did come from the main entrance, you do come to this amazing, uh, the crucifixion by Giotto, which is, uh, you can see here, circa 1290, so it's reasonably early. Um, there's a kind of a close-up of the Giotto. And what I want to take you to here, let's go back and... Actually, let's just go back again there because I want you. This is what I'm about to show you. Where my cursor is now is this chapel here by Brunelleschi, the Gondi Chapel. Um, and again, you'll notice this is 1410, 25. Uh, again, seeing how the, this echoes, absolutely echoes the Giotto crucifixion. Um, and again, he's recorded being in, I mean, even he was living around Santa Maria Novella, Giotto, I think it's about 1301, even later, that it's recorded. Um, he was, there was, in terms of most things, um, in terms of knowledge about Giotto, the fact that he was actually a great businessman. I think it's Mac, well, spoken that he was married twice, had about eight children, um, rented looms. I mean, he was a bit of a modern day, you could say Damien Hurst in terms of the business side. Um, but really but it's great the human aspect and this is really what what touches everybody is extraordinary yes the businessman but great love uh again a sense of humanity there's i put this in because brunelleschi was the architect who famously designed the dome of course of the duomo in florence um there's more of a close-up of the the crucifixion the carved crucifixion by brunelleschi um and here is another crucifixion by the artist Masaccio, the painter. And of course, who taught Masaccio, well, particularly linear perspective, is Brunelleschi. So the idea of the architect Brunelleschi, who also we saw the sculpture, taught Masaccio. And of course, this is a great vaulted ceiling, which is celebrated as being attributed to being the first uh, example of with true force of linear perspective. There, of course, is amazing uh, autopiece from Pisa, which is in the National Gallery, which is just as, um, uh, well, just, it's just actually just slightly after this date. But in terms of seeing the first example, this is always attributed to being the first one. Um, and what I've got here, it should work, is a little video. So from this standpoint, 
So this is in the Santa Maria Novella. So from here we are in the center of the church, looking towards the, the Masaccio. Uh, um, this is, and what we do, you just turn, just sweep up. And we're going to come to the crucifix by Giotto. There's a Giotto. There is also, you see my body, there's the Brunelleschi. I just think from that one standing in that one position, look what you experience. You go from Giotto to Brunelleschi, Brunelleschi to Masaccio. You've got the great, the beginning, the history of what a great, of the Renaissance. And all coming from Giotto. And there it is again, how we experienced actually being there looking up. And it's, just imagine ourselves in that Renaissance. This was making a hole. We might even call it this sense of trompe l'oeil, making this physical space. We have kind of, um, I suppose we have all these um, three dimensional cartoons. Um, Pics, um, what are those? Well, not Walt Disney, but extraordinary images we might see today. We're, we're so used to the sense of the three dimensions on a two dimensional surface on our sort of TV screens, but um, just imagine actually really experiencing this this physicality. And of course, this sense of realism it all comes from Giotto. Here's a kind of a close up, and I've just put this in because this is the cloisters of the Santa Maria Novella. I just think this is amazing war the fact that here's the back where i'm putting the cursor now the other side of you've got the massaggio and of course these are where you cello um where you have the flood and there's early ones um famous famous with the again with linear perspective which are now in you go through here to where i think it was the uh can not the canteen uh where they they fed um we now moving to santa croce um again in Florence, so the facade, and here we are just inside. And we're just going to swiftly move through here. So, again, the famous uh, chapels, the body chapels, with again the life of St. Francis. And again, these are very famous images. And what I put here, here's Michelangelo on the right, and there it is the figures that he's drawing, he's copying from here. Again, so when you're actually in this chapel, just think of all the great artists who have been um so Masaccio looking from to Giotto Michelangelo drawing on that same slab in the actual chapel itself drawing from Giotto and here is the Scrivini chapel so in Padua just um west of Venice so really if you take a train from Venice about half an hour um and you come to this arena chapel. So where we, where this photograph would have been taken behind you, you do have an actually a, a Roman arena, um, not as grand as you would have in Verona, of course. Um, and here's the interior. So this is very much when you walk. Actually, I want to go back to here. Uh, I can remember walking through the main door here pretty every week. Um, now you have to go into some sort of chambers, decontamination kind of chamber. Etc. Uh, but here we just, just walk through the slab of that foot slab is a I remember the dent in it. So again, just thinking about all the people who have walked through and artists who have walked through here. And this very much is what you're confronted with. Um, this famous ceiling of the blue ceiling, all this amazing blue that we're gonna be, uh, touch upon. Um here again it is, you'll see, um, you know, from a higher up from scaffolding, this photograph would have been taking from. Um I'm going to talk about the narrative. The narrative actually starts uh, well in terms of the, the expulsion of Joachim um, from from this corner here, which we're going to look look into. Um, just going to talk about the idea of the blue ceiling because it's probably one of the most famous ceilings in uh, the history of art. Is actually I've got here azurite blue. It's not lapis lazuli, which you often might hear it's spoken about. Uh, you've got deterioration here, which we can see. Uh, in we're going to look at the the CC ceiling, which is also azurite. But this is lapis lazuli, of course, in the in the famously in the Titian. Um, but here uh, again, another Venetian artist. These both paintings from the National Gallery. You've got azurite blue. This blue here in the Bellini would be azurite blue. It's a much cooler blue. It's greener in comparison to the warmth of lapis. Um, and there it is here, the same thing here. Look how it's going green. So you know it's azurite, this, and it's actually this salt in the air, the damp in the air, um, 
goes and say this might be a CC, but it's still again getting the, the dab, uh, going to the screen, which is malachite. Um, and actually Padua being not far, that Veneto gets gets very damp, um, be far damper than you would get here in the CC. And this is the idea of an ultramarine. You see, this is sort of redder. So blue might be a cold color, but you've got the warmth, the redness of the ultramarine versus this is like this kind of cerulean, it's greener. So you have temperatures of color. Um, and I put this quote in by Yves Klein, of course, famous for his blue and famous for the ultramarine. What is blue? Blue is invisible, becoming visible. Blue has no dimensions. It is beyond the dimensions of which other colors partake. What does he mean by that? Well, let's look at the storytelling. I'm saying, um, yes, you have, uh, here's God through here and is sending off um, the angel Gabriel to, to message to uh, uh, Mary. But we've got here um, Joachim, which is Mary's father. And we can, there's a story. I'll just go back to you. Make that work. There it is. Here, it's, this is the storytelling wraps round and actually wraps round. You see my uh, cursor wrapping round, um, finishing over here. Um, but what I wanted to take you here is because this is the expulsion of um, Joachim, um, that first scene, and we move into the Joachim among the shepherds. But what I want to highlight is this extraordinary. Uh, psychological aspect of this void of the blue, um, just going into the space, into the void. Um, again, it's just reminding me of, of artists, I think of Barnett Newman, where again, very much you think Barnett Newman not only did the red, we might think of his red and the zip, uh, the, the idea of a vertical line, but there's one called Cathedra, which is, is all blue, which is very similar. And again, that sense of symbolism and colour field and but let's have a look here at Mark Rothko. Again, this idea of the chapel, this color field, being again, the psychological aspect. And I think all of this is within uh, the, the influence of, um, of from, from Giotto. Um, let's, I mean, I just find that absolutely kind of extraordinary. At this time, you've got this concept. It is conceptual art. Art has always been conceptual. Art has always been kind of abstract. Um, here, the storytelling, we're going to come on this last, uh, here, the most famous images, this one, the deposition of Christ. But we're just going to look at the road to Calvary again, the, the human tragedy, the tension is just quite extraordinary. Here's Mary. This is the lapis, of course. The lapis lazuli is, again, put on a secco uh, idea of dry. So you've got the underdrawing. Uh, again, so the same thing with the Christ. So there's lapis rather than the azurite. But look at the way this is being pulled apart. Um, this also, we're, we're going to touch upon this diagonal of the cross, uh, relates to the whole picture, the surface of the actual, um, of the uh, 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 chapel itself. As I say, we can see we go to the crucifixion. Of course, we then have the deposition, um, which I want to focus upon because probably one of the most famous images in Western art. Um, and I'm putting forward actually, so the Cezanne, there's no mention. Cezanne doesn't talk about Giotto, he does talk about drawing from what's no, he's they speak about it in terms of primitives. Uh, that's not in a geography sense, drawing from the, the early Renaissance in the Louvre in Paris. Uh, and actually, if you count all these figures, there's 11, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. The same figures, not if you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Um, but look at the actual what's happening here. Look at the feet. I think this is the same. I'm absolutely convinced uh, the, the Cezanne bathers is influenced by this by this image. Look at the back figures, speaking the office here, these back figures. Um, again, really the uh, movement, one, two, three, back into space, one, two, three, back into space. Um, this idea of this triangle, of course, it comes from the idea of the Baroque Rubens, which we know how uh, uh, Cezanne was hugely influenced by, and of course, the idea of Poussin, we were doing, again, also Baroque, relating to uh, redoing Poussin out in nature. It's a famous quote. And of course, the Rococo artists like Watto and, and Boucher, et cetera. Um, so this idea of this sort of bathers uh, that life's all marvelous out in the, um, out in, out in the kind of utopia kind of co concept. Um, and this idea, this sort of triangle, I've just put this here again, you got this, and this is what I meant by uh, CC, the idea of the geometry before you paint 
each individual scene, you've got to work out the geometry of this. I mean, it's lovely. This is the north wall, which, of course, the south wall had the windows. Um, but again, just working this out and you get from here, you get diagonals. Again, I've, I've stood here just drawing this. Obviously, there's a there's a simple idea, the diagonal, diagonal here, making a triangle. But of course, this links to this. Everything links. There's diagonal movement, of course, which you get in um, Cezanne. I mentioned about the Baroque in terms of movement. Di in art, you have horizontal, vertical, diagonals in terms of compositional kind of uh, con concepts. Um, so there we go. Yeah. So there, do you see the idea? Well, there's a triangle there, but the whole of this movement, again, counterbalanced through here which you've got on the 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 scene there's a scene doing that there of course uh the the, the resurrection of christ and no me don't don't touch me so an art which isn't feeling based on feeling isn't an art at all feeling is a principle the beginning and end craft objective technique all these are in the middle. That's Cezanne. Often Cezanne has been accused of being kind of cold. But no, you see, you can imagine he's an artist responding to the feeling and, and human emotion. I mean, Giotto possibly it could only have been about 34, 38. Uh, think of what he'd experienced in life to be able to paint such, a, such an image. And of course, here's Henry Matisse, which again, I think this is influenced by the, the deposition of Christ. Um, and here's a famous quote. When I see the Giotto's frescoes at Padua, I do not trouble myself to recognize which scene of the life of Christ I have before me, but I immediately understand the sentiment which emerges from it. What is in the lines, the composition, the color. Of course, this is from 1908, after visiting Italy, July 1907, Florence here in Arezzo, Ravenna, Padua and Venice. This is spoken about is, is the influence, of course, Matisse, influenced by Cezanne, seeing the bathers. But this is absolutely... Uh, Set the set again. The emotional content, the human content, is being, in my opinion, is inspired by this deposition. Why a turtle? I don't know. In terms of almost like the metaphor for all that sentiment, um, they talk about chewing nails. I read here. It's not. It's this again. Think of what's happening in the clasped hands, um, and here's the Saint Francis. This idea of this band uh, again. You've got the idea of land, sea, and sky. Uh, that simple bandwidth, which you get of other Matisse's, um, like there's the, the the bowl players and there's even the dance of uh, this same period with Matisse, which is again all influenced, I'd say, then from seeing um, the, the the again attributed to Giotto uh, in in Assisi, and I think it's interesting north uh, on Ravenna, so go further north and further east of Assisi, you've got this amazing, the Ravenna, the great mosaics, uh, which I think, you know, yeah, did John, those artists would have seen th th these works. Uh, so actually how they would have been influenced. And I mentioned actually Giotto, there's the, one of the Roman artists in Assisi called Petro Calvini, where there's a great work in Rome in the Travisteri. There's the Last Judgment. Uh, so again, every, every artist is always learning from an, another artist before. So just to, to sum up, um, we've done a really swift journey here in a half an hour. Uh, for me, Giotto is the summit of my desires, but the road leading to an equivalent in our age is too long for one lifetime. Meanwhile, it leads through interesting stages. Um, I think the interesting is not a very good word. I think that's the uh, translation from the French to the English. Um, but to think, I mean, um, the, the idea of Matisse, again, those early works, um, so you see what he's saying um, in 1908. Then we've got, here is much letter. This is the last letter, by the way, to, to Pierre Bonnard. And just want to relate, I've got put here on the on the, um, on the the left, you know, of course, the Vents Chapel. So there's, um, again, when he was given this commission from the nuns, Vents Chapel, he absolutely was thinking of uh, the, the, the Giotto in Padua. And I'd say one of the great last works, by Matisse, The Sorrows of the King, which is um <clears throat> extraordinary work, uh, which when Matisse was actually, um, was, was dying, which again, I think it's absolutely to do with the deposition uh, from the Giotto. I'll stop sharing. Well, that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm sure everybody really enjoyed that. I particularly loved the blue 
honestly I, as soon as you said Ravenna it made me think because I was I was there recently it also made me think obviously about the ceiling in the Gala Placidia's mausoleum but it also made me think of the ceiling in the Neonian baptistry there so absolutely beautiful um I'm going to open the floor out to questions now because we don't, you know, we won't have very much time at the end. I did just want to remind everybody that we host events like this very frequently and all of our previous events will be posted on our YouTube. You can go find them now. Um, but yes, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand and we can unmute you. Niente. <laughs> means nothing that's a very swift um uh anyway yes i i have a question <laughs> thank you very much andy that was um that was wonderful and um I, it's so lovely to see those works what the question that that i think is is so interesting is why did giotto start painting this way what was it about this particular moment in time that led to this kind of change from the from the icon type of painting to this naturalistic this observation of nature and this infusion of emotion and this sort of desire to show people as human beings rather than just as sort of ciphers for religious beliefs yes yeah, so, so again very good question nicola the, the... Again, the idea of this humanism idea, so and actually fundamentally is to do with so that from that Christianity, a lot of people couldn't bluntly people couldn't read. So it was a visual language. So you got this idea of the heavenly concepts of which the iconography is, I say it wasn't to do with uh, any sense of uh, ignorance uh, in terms of the idea of realism. It was a it was a con concept, uh, kind of a philosophy. So again, um this idea of making it kind of earth-like and so people basically could, could understand it. Uh, you could even say it's a so social, uh, being a, kind of like a socialist. Uh, and we can th think actually in, in Britain when you had the um, the, the Euston Road School, this idea of um, social realism, and that was again, um, I'm thinking here in the 19, well, the 1930s, um, that concept from the School of Paris, actually where you had Matisse um, and, and Picasso, they thought that again these British, some British artists, Sir William Coldstream. Uh, Victor Passmore, Claude Rogers. It was an idea of making it um, this idea of realism, so people could understand it. But in a way, that's not that far different to what the concept they had there, at the beginning of the Renaissance, was for for the ordinary people to be able to they could read the story um, and visually, um, and the idea of believing in it, so making it life like this idea of realism, the idea of drawing from observation. Um, so it wasn't out of this earth they could actually think it was real uh it could actually happen so jesus it did happen the idea of it did happen um and actually the last judgment is rather marvelous to see. i mean there's the things that's really warning you uh there's a bit of that control thing going on if you, i mean there's some horrific scenes in there uh i also think it's quite good to show politicians that anyway we'll go to the, um does that does that help answer yeah and again i think um Petrarch and people like that is the same with contemporary. So with 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 Dante again, they were very much that humanist idea of trying to get things down to to, to this earth. So yeah, like social realism. See, as Amanda. Um, hi, Andy. Um, thank you so much. I so enjoyed your. Um. And this is more of a sort of comment rather than a question, really. Um, I very much enjoyed your analysis of colour um, and how that has been relevant throughout the ages. And um, I, I'm interested because a lot of modern British artists fell in love with Giotto and his work, but obviously they hadn't seen it and they were looking at it in black and white. And so in some ways, I feel his work transcends an appreciation of colour and it's purely about sort of modelling and form um, and I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah I mean that's famous Stanley Spencer again of again of the Watto Giotto yeah. uh, um, and the, from the Berkeley Chapel particularly um, and absolutely to do those to do those forms so that three-dimensional mm. qu quality so yeah I mean one 
I mean, I, I, I did it a bit of um, like a Grand Prix speed. <laughs> um, but the idea of slowly, I mean, the idea of that, the sense of that form, I mean, each, paintings have so many different layers. So one could talk about, I, was, I just briefly mentioned about the diagonal movement, but, so the surface geometry, you could talk about the individual form, um, you can talk about the color, the tone. So you could strip a painting and an image down by layers. Um, which makes up the whole thing, and of course, then it comes down to like gestures. I mean, there's one could do a whole talk about just the gestures and mm. so forth. So, yeah, that story, that that, that narrative. Um, as, I, I mean, I think I'm just. I suppose I was just taken. I mean, still does affect you know. Um, I don't know what it is about Joshua that, that emotional co content in him. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Just still. I mean, I say with students like when we draw in the National Gallery, um, you know, these artists are alive. Uh, and you can get into the mind of the artist by actually by by drawing from them. And Dimitri said about me, um, you know, yes, I did. I was there I, when I first saw them um, on a kind of a well, the interrail thing when you were a student. <laughs> then I was lucky then to be there for a year. Uh, and I was there drawing every week and actually standing in the chapel. I was there, able to be there all day long. Now, I think you probably only get a half an hour. I was very yeah. lucky. What um, a wonderful experience. Yeah. And I, again, they just... I, um, they just knew who I was, and you know, this is superintendent. So, um, they just said, Oh, the Anglaise, and you know, and they started calling me. <laughs> um, but the, uh, so I was very lucky I could just be there as long as I want. I just drew there every, every you know, every week. Um, again, just trying to get into that mind, just to, uh, the formal aspects in terms of the form. Um, yeah, as you say, as, as so many other artists had, you know, had, had done. I know some, as you mentioned, Amanda. They hadn't necessarily been, but some art, a lot of artists had had gone to to, to visit the, ch the chapel. Yeah, I'm, I'm imagining the Bloomsbury group. I mean, they're, they're all Vanessa Bell and Duncan, again, they're, obviously with Clive Bell, part of that relationship again with Suzanne, that idea of form, uh, which always goes back to kind of Giotto. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs>